Sandy Tatum speaking on behalf of the Executive Committee of the United States Golf Association to enlist you as a USGA associate. The United States Golf Association is a nonprofit organization organized in 1894 for the singular purpose of promoting and preserving the game of golf. It does so with a broad spectrum of activities, which include the conduct of national championships such as the United States Open Championship, rules with regard to implements and balls that preserve the integrity of the game, the making and interpretation of the rules of golf, which are the means by which we define the game we play, and ensure that all of us are playing the same game, the organization and promotion of a national system of handicapping to ensure that golf can be played equitably by amateur golfers wherever it is played in this country, and a museum and a library which preserves the memorabilia of the game of golf and all of its traditions in a lovely setting in Far Hills, New Jersey, and a green section dedicated to research and education and training on the proper maintenance of golf courses. The United States Golf Association recently has organized an associates program, the purposes of which are to bring the golfers of this country into closer contact with the USGA and therefore with the game of golf. There are some amenities involved in being a USGA associate, such as receiving the, the golf journal, such as receiving the rules of golf book, such as a bag tag and a decal, and other amenities that are of real importance. But the most important factor involved in being a USGA associate is that it identifies him or her who is one as being someone who specially cares about the game of golf and manifests that caring by becoming a United States Golf Association associate. So we urge you to do so. Write to us at Golf House at Far Hills, New Jersey and identify yourselves as people who specially care about this game of golf and specially care about supporting the United States Golf Association in all that it does to promote and preserve this game of golf. Inverness, Toledo, Ohio, and the United States Open. The memories come flooding back. Nineteen twenty, when Britain's Harry Varden, fifty years old, was five strokes ahead, then played the last seven holes, seven over par. And another Briton, Ted Ray, himself forty-three, relit his pipe, nonchalantly puffed, and proceeded to win. That year, an 18-year-old amateur played his first Open, Bob Jones, who finished eighth. And in 1957, in Vernessa's third Open, the second having been 1931, an even younger amateur made his debut, Jack Nicholas, who scored two 80s and missed the cut. And now, 1979. The ghosts join hands with the wind rustling the trees and we seek modern parallels. Will America's Arnold Palmer play Britain's Varden? He's around 50 now, too. Maybe he can. Is there a young amateur to play Jones? Bob Clampett, perhaps. He was a low amateur last year. Or maybe John Cook, the United States amateur champion, 
following the footsteps of Nicholas. Now indeed a member of Jack's Muirfield Village Club. Nicholas will play himself. 22 years and 23 opens on. And there won't be a Ted Ray. There are no public pipe smokers, indeed, no Britons. The leader of Europe's Order of Merit has been invited, but he's a Spaniard, Severiano Ballesteros. On his way to imminent fame, though not here. Also invited, the leaders of four other overseas orders of merit, including the Japanese, Aoki, and a Taiwanese, Xu Shang San. It's all a reminder of how golf has changed since 1920. Its balance of power, its strength in depth, indeed, its democracy. Sandy? Sandy! Hey, because here in 1920, Inverness became the first clubhouse to open its doors to the championship professionals. A gesture so momentous that the pros presented the club with a clock that still bears their humble message of gratitude. God measures men by what they are, not in wealth possess. This vibrant message chimes afar, the voice of Inverness. What of the Inverness stage on which these pipe dreams of comparison will be dreamed? It's a typically demanding championship setup as ordained by the United States Golf Association. Narrow fairways, deceptively heavy rough, and fast greens. At Inverness, rather small, difficult fast greens, burnished by hot sun and wind. Nicholas's double bogey six at the final hole on the first day, and more so his second day 77, are blows from which he won't recover. But he does make the cut for the last two rounds on 151, which is more than may be said for other almost legendary names. Tom Watson, the favorite. Ray Floyd. Johnny Miller. Fuzzy Zoller, the Masters champion. Gene Littler. Ballesteros. And, less surprisingly perhaps, in his first U.S. Open, Shu. All these have failed, and others have struggled, like Andy North. <laughs> Thus has the defending champion qualified for the last two rounds, by a birdie. And at halfway, the leading contenders come from the ranks of the outsiders. Your commentator, Peter Alice. Tom Pertzer, six years a professional, but only once an American winner. Second shot to the 18th, and it looks a beauty, if it's up. Yes, just pitches on the edge of the green and starts going down towards the hole. Just look at the pace on these greens. Perts are putting for a birdie three. So Pertz are 69 today, the only player so far to finish under par for 36 holes, three under. But out on the course, there's Larry Nelson from Georgia, also three under. Second shot, 18th hole. And what a beautiful shot, pitch short again. the crowd incidentally another Nelson Byron Nelson who won the open 40 years ago then became the professional here watching to see if Larry Nelson who won his first tour tournament last winter can hold for a birdie and be the outright leader 
And he's overdone it just to touch, but he'll tap that in for his par four and a splendid round of 68. Nelson and Kurtz are then the joint leaders at halfway on 139. Many good players, three shots and more behind them. And our nostalgic parallels having a bad time. Palmer is 10 strokes behind the leaders. But Nicholas, the real Nicholas, and Cook, the embryo Nicholas, have only just scraped through. And Clampett, our would-be emulator of Jones, hasn't made the cut at all. We're down to modern realities. The third day, more than 21,000 spectators, 88 degrees. And now at the fourth hole, it's Lee Elder, three over par. Right in for a birdie three. Now two over and five off the lead. What a shot. Of the overnight leaders, Nelson soon meets disaster. And Pertzer is ultimately unseated by the pressure of two men. One is Tom Weisskopf, three over par overnight. And reducing to below par today. The other, Hale Irwin, the champion of 1974. He's level par, playing the par five, eighth hole. Here's his third shot. Maybe a little strong. Ah, but look at that backspin. Beautiful shot from Irwin. Irwin, desperate for victory. Hard to believe he's not had a win for two years. But now, a chance for a birdie four. A birdie for Irwin, one under. For Irwin, it's the start of a crucial burst. TV viewers see him birdie the 11th, the 12th as well. Then come to the par 5, 13th. An awkward side hill lie. This hole, 523 yards. That's a two iron. Here she comes, and right at the hole. Could it go in? An almost certain eagle three for Irwin. Five under par and four strokes clear of the field. But now, triumph is followed by setbacks. He bogeys the 14th and 15th and goes back to three under. His nearest rival now, Tom Weisskopf, one under. Weisskopf has played the 17th. Irwin follows him. 431 yards. A good par four. Irwin's second shot. And yet another splendid iron shot, dead on line, trifle short. Playing with him at plus four, Bill Rogers, second shot. One of the few golfers not to use a left-hand glove in modern golf. And even better, but spinning back from the hole. Irwin with an outside chance for a birdie. there. So Irwin four under par. Rogers having got his par here at the 17th is still four over. Only one other man under par in the total column and that's Tom Weisskopf ahead at the 18th. What a lovely hole it is. 354 yards. That's all a simple par four. But is it? Weisskopf one under Here's his second shot to this tiny sloping green, surrounded by bunkers. And there it is. Obvious chance for a birdie. Playing with Weisskopf, Jerry Pate, who won this championship in 1976. And he's having a good round today as well, coming down from three over to one over. Ideal position on the fairway. He doesn't care about the golf. Pate settles, smiles. 
Very relaxed, young man. Fate second. And inside Weisskopf. Both with great chances for birdie. Well, the championship leader, Hale Irwin, prepares to play behind them. Just to wait a moment or two, just getting settled. Meanwhile, up ahead, Weisskopf prepares to putt for a birdie three. This for a round of 66. All right, go on, Dave. Par here, 71. Round of 67, total of 212. That's one under par. Huge, colourful galleries now watching Pate. Can he hold this for a three? He's seen why Scott's ball fall away. And he's done the same thing. Knowledgeable shakes of the head. Pate to par four, round of 69. Total 2-1-4, that's just one over par. But behind them, at four under par, Hale Irwin, again from the ideal position, dead centre of the fairway. Up onto this green, which slopes from right to left. Spins away, leaves Irwin. A difficult one. Just look at that ball going ever down the slope. Face now with a difficult one, and he knows it. Irwin on the last green with this long, difficult, curly putt. Huge swing. Here she turns, and well, he does very well to get it to the hole side. He'll walk up, tap in. For a par four, a round of 67. That's 209 for three rounds. Good scoring indeed, although it must be said, conditions a lot easier today. Far less wind than on the first two days. But Irwin, four under. The right hand side of the board showing Weisskopf at one under, Pate and Pertzer, one over, Lielder and Larry Nelson, two over. So the fourth and final day. Again, huge crowds. A hot, humid day with a gusty wind returning. And Irwin, the leader, has had virtually a sleepless night. Still, with Irwin three strokes clear, anyone on the fringe of contention has got to break through early. On the second green, Phil Rogers. Seven behind overnight. Looking good, and what a par four. Well, that perhaps gives us a sample of what sort of pressure may well be applied to Mr. Irwin throughout this day. Meanwhile, back on the par four first, Pertzer and Pate, both one over par, five off the lead. Pate's second shot first. The medium short iron. And just gets on the cutting surface, but you can see the flag today very close to the front of the green. Now, Tom Pertzer, with the elevated green. So many of the holes here look simple, but have proven very formidable. Pertzer, easy swing, nine iron wedge, up onto the green, and look at this one. Oh, what a start. What a start. former champion, just watching Pertzer putting for a birdie three. Yes, dead centre, goes to level par. Good start, as behind them, the final pair, pair to start their round. Now on the tee, time voice cop, play away please. Weisskopf, who grew up in the state of Ohio and watched the 1957 Open here as a youngster of 15. Oh, that 
looks safe enough. I think Weisskopf is just off the fairway. But anyway, Irwin the leader by three strokes. As Pate and Pertzer play the second. Both safely on in two, this par four hole. Pertzer a long way away. a good speed oh, <laughs> very good speed indeed a second birdie in two holes now one under par now Pate and booms it in for another birdie level par and Irwin behind them hears the cheers and must realise that already the pressure is well and truly on and word comes from the course that Gary Player, the South African, nine behind overnight, is going great guns. Here he is, holding a nasty one, going to four over par. The man who, in the 1978 Masters at Augusta, began the final day seven strokes behind the leader and won the championship. Now Irwin and Weisskopf at the second hole. Irwin still four under par, Again, one of those medium short iron shots. Looking good, right at the flag. Oh, quite superb. That's the way to keep your lead. Now Weisskopf, he dropped a shot at the first. Here she comes up and almost looks as if it tips the ABC blimp and goes through the back of the green. Trouble for Weisskopf, dropped one at the first, struggling at the second. Gusty conditions here today, making club selection very tricky indeed. Weisskopf through the green and where all the spectators have been trampling around, difficult shot. No, stubbed it, tried to be too delicate, now facing a minor disaster. Has to hold this to salvage his par four. No, so that's a five and another stroke dropped by Weisskopf. Now one over par. Now Irwin for a birdie three. Yes, dead center goes to five under par. Grim faced Weisskopf, two bogeys in two holes, begins to slip away. And now just ahead at the short third, 185 yards, Pate and Pertzer. Pertzer, one under par. Very difficult pin placement today. Swirling wind. And looked as if it was going to be strong, but dug in, went back towards the flag, which is very close to the water. Now Jerry Pate. First prize here, $50,000. Oh, look at that. Oh, it just didn't stop quite quickly enough, but an excellent shot just inside Pertzer. That's the way to watch. Quite a swing on this putt. Pertzer, who's got off to a, a really hot start. wings away but that's an almost certain par three for Tom now Pate as he learnt from Pertzer's putt big swing from the right all the way a winner what a beauty a birdie two he goes to one under par the same as Pertzer as Hale Irwin follows them up this same difficult par three. Looks to be strong. A little bit left. Into the crowd, they're stopping it. Are they trampling it? The ball could lay in dead right there. Sandy Tatum, the USGA, makes the ruling. Yeah. 
Well, in fact, the ball finished on a blanket. It was moved by one of the spectators. That uh, constitutes an outside agency. Irwin has to drop. And as you can see, the slope takes the ball away further from the hole. He has another go. And I suspect there's not much to stop this ball rolling and we might have a place situation. In fact, we do. Right there. Very precisely done. Now, after a little delay, Irwin lines up his second shot. The short hole. Stubbed it a little bit. Going left and running away. And you can see how the wind's whipping the little waves on the lake. Conditions not easy. Now Irwin for his par three. And uh, no. So he drops the stroke, goes back to four under. While ahead at the four, it's Pate and Pertzer. This is a super par four hole. Pertzer with a long putt again across the green, this crowned green. He's playing three, and he'll be very happy to get down in two. Racing down across the green. <laughs> it's right in the hole. Three birdies in four holes. Now only two strokes behind Irwin. Well, would you believe it? And way up ahead, Gary Player still going well. Now, three over. So much for the first of the three acts that comprise this last day drama. Irwin under pressure. Now begins act two, because Pertzer can't keep up this pressure. He bogeys the fifth, sixth, and seventh, and his end will virtually come at the par five eighth which requires we allude to the embarrassing story of the tea and the tree. The eighth is a new par five, 528 yards, and on the first day, Chichi Rodriguez, for one, found a novel way of shortening it. He turned half left, drove down the neighboring 17th, then back toward the eighth green. Lon Hinkle made a birdie that way, inducing imitators. The USGA promptly planted a 25-foot Christmas tree as a deterrent. The players, or some of them, resorted to more ingenuity. Chi-Chi teed up on a pencil and aimed over the trees. Hinkle tried steering between them. But the shortcut has hazards as well, and on this final day, Pertzer incurs them. Playing six this par five hole. No, oh, and that's a double bogey seven for Pertz, a tragedy, because he's played so well for three and a half days of this championship. And now playing the eighth in more sensible and orthodox fashion, Irwin. Three under now, having bogeyed the fifth hole. He drove into the trees, it bounced back on the fairway. Here's his third shot. Clatters into the flag, and an adventurous hole for Irwin, but he's got a chance for a birdie four. Weisskopf fading now, sadly. Two over, but Irwin, after some adventures, putting for a birdie. And getting it. Four under again, and really surging along. Five strokes ahead, ten holes to play. Then six ahead, and nine to play. Shades of Varden. Meantime, Gary Player at the final hole. He's three over. He's picked up two strokes on par today, and none of the other contenders has done that. That's a good shot. Over the bank, but trickling down the slope, as so many have done before, and getting further from the hole. It's a marvellous performance by Player. Nearly 43 years of age, like Ted Ray back in 1920. 
this difficult cup for a birdie in a round of 68. Well, it's there, quite superb. A 68, a score of 286 for four rounds. That's two over par, and the leader so far in the championship. And out on the course, Act 3 begins. For he who believes Irwin is a runaway winner knows nothing of the torment of a tired leader whose game is going sour on the final stretch. He's bogeyed the 14th, but he's three under with just two holes to play. Tee shot at the 17th going to the right. Watching anxiously, but shouldn't be too far off the fairway. Good par four, difficult par four. Flag today, left side of the green. Irwin off the right-hand side of the fairway. He's walked up to the top of the hill to get a view of the green. And he's a little bit unlucky. He's just missed the short cut of rough, but it's not lying too badly. The grass going with him. And I do believe he can drive the ball under the branches of that tree. This is a five iron. Yes, well hit, but it's a touch left. Short left and catches the sand and leaves Irwin one of the most difficult shots in golf, the long bunker shot with the flag fairly close to the edge of the green. Oh no. No. He shot it right into the gallery, over the green, and it sounded a bit hard, and Irwin thinks so as well. That ball over the green amongst TV cables, and Irwin will get a free drop. Drops it, and this time the ball rolls closer to the hole. So once again, Sandy Tatum saying, place it just there. Awkward little chip up and down the green. Looks a good one, but this green very fast. Look at it go, look at it swing. And it's still going. Well, Irwin with this putt for a one over par five, two putts, an ugly six. That's a very ugly six indeed, a double bogey. In 1920, Varden double bogeyed this same 17th hole and lost the championship. Of course, Irwin still has many strokes in hand, but I'm sure he's feeling very miserable at the moment. Meanwhile, just ahead at the 18th, Tom Kirchhoff has finished a disappointing six over par. So much going for him at one time. Now Pate, who's three over, has this for a 33. This to tie with Gary Player, and he does a round of 72, score 286, two over par. A very happy Jerry Tate as Hale Irwin plays this same final hole. The 18th has been a crucial factor in every open at Inverness since 1920. Only 354 yards, a simple looking par four, but full of trouble. Irwin can take six and still win, so it would appear to be all over. But is it? The dreaded signal away to the right and tries to get back into the short stuff. Doesn't quite. Huge crowds gathering. There's Irwin standing below the ball. Small green. Nine iron, that's going left. And thumps down in the bunker. And it's almost unbelievable to think this man was at one time six strokes ahead. He's still got a couple in hand, but there have been two playoffs in the three opens played here at Inverness, including the longest ever in 1931. Irwin then, third shot. 
deep bunker. Must get it out. Yes, he does. Well done. And he can afford the luxury of three putts from there and still be champion. But I'm sure his pulse rate is running pretty high at this moment. Oh, what relief. But not for Weisskopf. That's in for a round of 76, a total of 288, four over par. And that'll put him in a tie for fourth place with Bill Rogers and Larry Nelson. So near and yet so far once more for Weisskopf. Now the arena still as Irwin putts for his four. The 72nd hole. No. Finishes with a round of 75, a total of 284. That's level par. He wins the championship by two strokes. If the scores speak ill of this last day drama, consider also its leading actors and the stage. Inverness, beguilingly tough, denied any the right to break its par. And the three who came nearest are all past winners and proven champions. Pate gets the second place medal. Tying with player. You run out of medals? Yeah. You got you my check. <laughs> and the winner? The winner of an open, of course, needs special qualities. Taylor won heaven. And he ought now to receive the reward. Hale Irwin, a two time winner. Only Willie Anderson, Hogan, Jones, and Nicholas have done better.